I'm going to talk today about uh, the utilization of uh, TE and evaluation of uh, <clears throat> patients uh, with uh, Staph aureus bactremia. Let's just run uh, quickly through the objectives uh, of this lecture. I'm going to present some background information on Staph aureus bactremia, uh, why it's important um, that we recognize it in a timely manner. Um, I will present some background information on Staph aureus uh, associative infective endocarditis. We'll talk about the current state of guidelines on echocardiography use in the patients with suspected infective endocarditis. And uh, the second half of the lecture, I will present some uh, recent research data um, that covers uh, specifically this question, how to utilize uh, an echocardiography, specifically TEE, in the patients with uh, Staph aureus bactremia. You will see some abbreviation that I use uh, throughout this lecture. So the TTE will stand for transthoracic echocardiogram. TEE stands for transesophageal echocardiogram. SAB stands for Staphylococcus aureus bactremia. And IE stands for infective endocarditis. Let's talk a little bit about um, the background information. Information. As we all know, uh, Staph aureus is a highly virulent pathogen, which is a um, which is the leading cause of bacteremia in both community and healthcare associated settings. It accounts for about 20% of all healthcare associated bacteremias. It is important to recognize it in a timely manner because of the mortality associated with it. The literature shows that a 30 day all cause mortality of Staph aureus bacteremia ranges between 20 to 30 percent, and that has not changed significantly since the uh, 1990s. Uh, Staph aureus is the most common cause of infective endocarditis. 5 to 15 percent of the patients with the Staph aureus bacteremia have or will develop infective endocarditis. The mortality in Staph aureus associated infective endocarditis is even higher and ranges uh, between 90 to 19 to 65 percent based uh, uh, on the literature. As we know, Staph aureus infective endocarditis is a common condition that is often clinically indistinguishable from Staph aureus uh, bacteremia. It has um, a high mortality if inadequately treated. Uh, there are two major mechanisms that are recognized. Infective endocarditis may be the primary so source of Staph aureus bacteremia, or infective endocarditis uh, may develop as a secondary metastatic complication from hematogenous seeding of cardiac valves from extracardiac infectious source. The presence of infective endocarditis should be considered in all patients with a Staph aureus bacteremia. Based on the literature, TEE is considered a test of choice and is known to be superior to TTE uh, in evaluation uh, of infective endocarditis. However, there is a um, limited evidence that TEE specifically should be performed in all patients with a Staph aureus bacteremia. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the echocardiography and uh, its role in general uh, in uh, evaluation of Staph aureus bacteremia. So echocardiography has its dual role in the patients with Staph aureus bacteremia. Um, if it's performed or when it's performed within the first days of bacteremia, it helps to rule out infective endocarditis as a cause of uh, SAB, and uh, it might be needed at a later time to rule out infective endocarditis as a consequence of bacteremia. It is known that TEE is a more sensitive test than TTE in diagnosing of infective endocarditis. And the sensitivity of TE ranges from 
85 to 90 percent versus 75 percent for transthoracic one. TEE is known to be superior in the settings of prosthetic valves and uh, intracardiac devices as well. However, TEE has its own disadvantages. Um, we have to remember that this test is not readily available in some of the hospitals on 24-7 um, basis, and some of the hospitals do not perform this test even on a daily basis. Even though the risk of procedures with TE is low, it, it is a semi-invasive procedure that carries um, a small risk of complications, such as esophageal perforation, um, as per literature, occurs in one in 5,000 of TEEs performed. Uh, it is time-consuming. It is also a um, costly test. Um, and also the literature, and uh, even if you talk to the specialists, they will tell you that the quality of transthoracic echocardiograph these days, they significantly improved comparing to even five years ago. The current state of the guidelines actually recommend to first perform TTE and then to proceed with TEE only in certain patients uh, group. And uh, now we're going to um, look um, at the most recent guidelines which were published in a circulation journal in 2015. So they're, they're very updated and recent, and specifically we will uh, talk about the diagnosis part that covers particularly the use of uh, echocardiography in suspected infective endocarditis. As I already mentioned, um, the guidelines state that transthoracic echocardiogram should be performed in all cases of suspected infective endocarditis. And this is class one level of evidence B at this point. We all know that both TTE and TEE performed in many patients with a suspected infective endocarditis. And the guidelines recommend that if the patient is assigned to high um, risk category, there is moderate to high clinical suspicion. Or if you anticipate that the patient will be um, a difficult imaging candidate, the TEE should be performed as soon as possible in those case scenarios. Some cost-effectiveness studies suggest that TEE actually should be the first examination in adults with infective endocarditis. However, as we already discussed, uh, it's not possible most of the times. And as I just mentioned, the guidelines recommend that even if you choose to perform TE first, uh, transthoracic echocardiogram should still be performed um, uh, as a baseline for rapid and non-invasive comparison for future images. So I think that's something to uh, keep in mind. Uh, what else um, the guidelines uh, have to say about uh, the echocardiography use? Number one, TEE should be done if initial transthoracic images are negative or inadequate for patients in whom there is an ongoing suspicion for infective endocarditis or there is a concern for intracardiac complications in patients with an in initial positive TTE. Number two, if there is a high suspicion of infective endocarditis despite an initial negative TEE, the repeat TE is recommended in three to five days or sooner if clinical findings change. And number three, repeat uh, transesophageal echocardiography should be done after an initial positive TE if clinical features suggest a new development of intracardiac complications. And um, all of these statements are class one level of evidence B. Uh, I included this um, algorithm or a graph, um, which again you can find uh, in the current guidelines, uh, that might help you uh, risk stratify the patient and uh, decide um, whether you would like to uh, perform um, 
uh, TTE uh, and again then depending on the uh, risk or on the risk or your suspicion either pursue TTE or not or whether you see on the right you decide to perform TTE first followed by TE as soon as possible and again you can uh, find it in in the uh, current guidelines for your reference uh, this is the exact uh, statement from the guidelines um, I will I will read it although interesting results suggest that there may be a high negative predictive value of TTE in some patients further work is needed to better define the subgroup of patients with a bloodstream infection caused by staph aureus who need only TTE to evaluate for infective endocarditis. Um, so at this point, the guidelines, they acknowledge that there might be a low risk category of patients that might not require TTE um, for, for the evaluation. And uh, now the second half of the lecture, uh, we will review the uh, current evidence um, and what literature has to uh, say about that. Um, several studies propose that TEE might be avoided in low-risk patients that lack certain infective endocarditis risk factors. Um, there is a great review paper which was uh, published in uh, JAMA uh, in 2014 by Holland et al. There, um, the authors of this paper analyzed uh, uh, nine studies uh, which included a little bit over 4,000 patients and all studies were observational. Uh, the TE was performed in 12 to 82 percent of the cases. They comment that all of the patients uh, were subject to a selection bias because they're um, they had higher pretest probability to start with. Um, they detected infective endocarditis with TEE in 14 to 28 cases, um, and infective endocarditis uh, was diagnosed using TTE in 2 to 15 uh, percent of the cases. There is one study, particular study by uh, uh, Dr. Cash et al., um, that is cited in literature multiple times, so I think it's important that we are uh, aware of this study. Um, this particular paper was published in Clinical Infectious Disease in uh, 2011, and uh, the researchers analyzed the results of two large prospective cohorts uh, of the patients that were admitted with hospital-acquired staph aureus bacteremia. So this study particularly addresses um, hospital-acquired staph aureus bacteremia only. Um, based on their analysis, the low-risk patients were selected based on the criteria set, which was applied six to eight days after first positive blood cultures. And uh, as you can see in this uh, little graph, so the criteria for proposed low-risk group uh, included, and the patient had to meet all of the criteria. Number one, no permanent intracardiac device. Number two, no prolonged bacteremia, which was um, defined as a duration of more than four days. Number three, no hemodialysis dependency. Number four, no spinal infection. And number five, no non-vertebral osteomyelitis. What is important to remember from this study, if the patient um, met all of the criteria, the negative predictive value uh, for ruling out endocarditis was 99.5%, uh, which is um, uh, obviously a, a very good number. So this study that uh, I just went over uh, with was included in the, in the review of other literature um, uh, that Holland et al. performed. And uh, based um, on their literature review, uh, they concluded that the factors associated with low risk of infective endocarditis were as follows. Absence of permanent intracardiac device, 
uh, sterile follow-up blood cultures within four days after initial set, no hemodialysis dependency, nosocomial acquisition of staph aureus bacteremia, no secondary foci of infection, and uh, the last one, no clinical signs of infective endocarditis. Um, the negative predictive value for the above low risk criteria was 93 to 100%. And uh, now we're going to talk about um, a study which was actually published recently in 2015 in a clinical um, uh, infectious disease uh, by uh, Dr. Paul Raj et al. Uh, based um, on an analysis of 678 patients that were hospitalized with staph aureus bacteremia uh, within uh, those five years, so July 2006 until June 2011. Based on this analysis, the authors created a scoring system to guide the use of echocardiography in the management of staph aureus bacteremia. They collected demographic, microbiologic, echographic, and follow-up data at 12 weeks, and then the data was analyzed. So here is a study results. Uh, from um, that cohort of patients, 85 patients, or 13%, was, were diagnosed with a definite infective endocarditis based on the Duke criteria. Um, in the community acquired staph aureus bacteremia uh, branch, uh, infective endocarditis was diagnosed in 22% of the cases. And community acquired staph aureus bacteremia was defined um, as a positive blood culture which was obtained on admission or within the first 48 hours of hospitalization. In the nosocomial SAB, Infective endocarditis was diagnosed in 9% of the patients, and the sacomial staph aureus bacteremia was uh, defined uh, as a um, positive blood culture, which was obtained uh, 48 hours after the initial hospitalization. Um, there is a third category, which, which they define as a community onset healthcare associated staph aureus bacteremia. In that particular group, uh, the infective endocarditis was diagnosed in 11% of the cases. And uh, this group is defined as a positive blood culture, either at the time of hospitalization or uh, which was obtained within uh, the first 48 hours of hus hospitalization in the patient that had um, some uh, healthcare contact prior to hospitalization. Um, so it's either the patient who resides in the nursing home, the patient with a history of um, recent hospitalization within 90 days, the patient who receives uh, home IV therapy or wound care, or the patient that attends a hemodialysis clinic um, or chemotherapy center. Based on their analysis, uh, they concluded that the independent predictors for infective endocarditis were as follows. Number one, community acquired staph aureus bacteremia. Number two, presence of cardiac device. And number three, prolonged bacteremia for more than 72 hours. As I already mentioned, uh, they came up with a two scoring system. Um, and the first um, uh, sis uh, scoring system was applied at day one or at the time of staph aureus bacteremia diagnosis. Uh, and the second step was applied at day five when day three culture results were known. And uh, this is the table that I imported from this particular um, paper. And as you can see, that they, they describe um, how the scoring system um, was developed, what what's in it, and how it correlates with the points that were assigned. So let's say the day one uh, scoring system uh, evaluated for the presence of a cardiovascular implantable electronic device, as well as the onset of staph aureus bacteremia. 
and as you can see, um, um, each um, graph would uh, assign you a certain number of points. And keep in mind that the score of equal or more than four uh, uh, was defined as a high risk uh, patients. Uh, the day five scoring system included the same parameters plus um, um, the presence of prolonged bacteremia, which was defined as uh, equal or more than 72 hours. So basically, day one risk score identified patients with uh, the highest risk uh, of infective endocarditis. The conclusion that was made, and I think it's pretty logical, that the patients with a risk score equal or more than four should undergo TEE as soon as staph aureus bacteremia is diagnosed. Uh, based on their analysis, the highest risk group was defined as a presence of implantable cardiac device um, who developed community-acquired staph aureus bacteremia. Uh, the patients that had initial risk score less than four um, were re-evaluated, reassessed on day five. For day five score, they used much lower cutoff, so the cutoff for the score was just two, um, and um, using that lower cutoff um, allowed them um, to come up with this very high negative predictive value of 98.8%. Uh, now I just want to uh, take a little break and uh, we will go over this case and uh, we will return back to uh, this paper and algorithm. So we have a 65-year-old male with a past medical history of uh, chronic systolic CHF. Uh, he has um, uh, ICD in place who was admitted to MICU with acute respiratory failure uh, due to community-acquired pneumonia. Uh, he required a CVC placement on admission. He was treated with IV ceftriaxone and azithromycin with improvement in his respiratory status. Blood cultures obtained on admission were negative. On day four, patient was recultured due to a new fever, and uh, one of the blood cultures uh, returned back positive for MSSA. Uh, CVC was promptly removed and repeat blood cultures, uh, two sets at 36 and 48 hours on treatment were negative. Um, and the question that I have um, uh, for our group, um, what imaging modality would you like to use? A, does not require imaging at all. B, TTE first and no further imaging if no new clinical data. And C, TTE. E followed by TEE. -E. Correct. Correct. It is um, based on um, the literature that we already renew, uh, reviewed, uh, actually a presence of uh, intracardiac device in the settings of nosocomial bacteremia, even if it's nosocomial bacteremia, the presence of the intracardiac device uh, um, would actually prompt you uh, to perform the TTE followed by TEE. Um, but I brought up this example just to see uh, how those scores, um, how you can apply those scores uh, in reality. So using the first model uh, by Dr. Cash et al., which was published in 2011, um, based on his model, uh, just the fact that the patient has an uh, intracardiac device in place should prompt you to perform uh, TEE using this criteria. Um, and on the right side, um, uh, I... Um, on the right side, I just described how um, you would calculate uh, the the score that we just um, that we just discussed. Uh, this patient has a day one score of two. He gets two points for the presence of ICD, and he has zero points for the presence of nosocomial staph aureus bacteremia. So at this point. Um, 
you would obtain a TTE, but his TEE can be deferred at this point. Uh, however, his day 5 score still remains at 2 because of the presence of intracardiac device, uh, which again, if you use the score, would prompt you to um, obtain a TEE uh, using this algorithm. If you have a same patient that did not have an intracardiac device, um, in this case, the TE can be uh, very safely emitted because the negative predictive value of uh, the patient without intracardiac device uh, um, having an infective endocarditis, it's, uh, uh, the negative predictive value is very high. And uh, this is the algorithm that you can find in uh, this paper uh, that I just talked about uh, that basically shows you step by step how you can apply this uh, scoring system. On day one, you calculate the score, and uh, based on that, you decide if the TE uh, needs to be performed um, as soon as possible or it can be deferred. If your day one score is less than four, uh, then you can defer an initial TE, but the patient needs to be reevaluated on day five. And some additional study result from uh, um, that article. 131 patients underwent both TTE and TEE. Uh, 41 of those had infective endocarditis. Uh, TEE was positive in 85% of the cases. Um, however, TTE was positive only in 34%. And uh, that basically confirms the prior literature that we're already aware of, that um, TEE has a, um, is a much more sensitive test in the diagnosis of, diagnosis of infective endocarditis. Correct, and I think uh, this is uh, why the second paper that we just reviewed has a day five score. Um, even if you decide that TE can be safely deferred in uh, on day one, um, uh, especially if you s still have intracardiac device in place, I think the suspicion for infective endocarditis in that particular patient would be very low. Um, however, um, at the day five score, as you remember, it included this criteria if prolonged bacteremia is present for uh, more than 72 hours. Um, I'm not sure if it's based on a, a prior literature that they concluded that 72 hours was a cutoff uh, when, you know, additional risk factors should be added to the score. But I'm not sure if it's based on the animal models or uh, just uh, observations, observational studies from uh, prior literature. Yes, the, that particular model basically tells you once you establish that the patient has intracardiac device, you're going to obtain a T, uh, TEE regardless. Um, that is correct. Uh, the study conclusion from um, uh, Paraj et al. Um, research um, showed that the strict application of proposed system 
uh, have resulted only in missing five infective endocarditis cases in Staph aureus bacteremia cohort. Um, and they described each and every single patient. Um, one of the examples is a recent hip surgery patient uh, that de developed acute septic arthritis uh, with a secondary bacteremia, which was a two-day in duration. Um, and the TE, which was obtained later, was positive for infective endocarditis. Interestingly enough, uh, when they looked back at those five patients, two out of five uh, had a prosthetic valve. And uh, after they reviewed this part of the study, actually prosthetic valve was added to the initial algorithm and was not included initially in the, uh, in the algorithm. They also comment if there is a high clinical suspicion despite not meeting scoring criteria, uh, TE should be obtained regard regardless um, uh, score. And uh, to conclude my presentation, what we know at this point is that all patients with a staph aureus bacteremia should undergo echocardiography. Current guidelines recommend TTE as the first diagnostic procedure. If TE performed first with positive findings, that then TTE should be performed next for future comparison. Uh, TTE is not sufficient for ruling out infective endocarditis, uh, and TEE should be performed in all high-risk group patients, such as persistent staph aureus bacteremia, despite appropriate antimicrobial therapy, unknown duration of bacteremia, or community-acquired bacteremia, the presence of permanent intracardiac devices, absence of evident removable source, hemodialysis dependency, the evidence of infection involving the back, such as osteomyelitis, discitis, and or epidural abscess, the presence of peripheral stigmata for infective endocarditis, as well as history of IV drug abuse. So as you can see, the, the list is uh, fairly long in this case. Uh, for low-risk patients, it may be reasonable to forego TE uh, in the following category of patients. Um, and all of the criteria, again, as I mentioned prior, all of the criteria have to be met. Um, such as it is a nosocomial staph aureus bacteremia, uh, sterile follow-up blood cultures within four days after initial blood cultures, no permanent intracardiac device, no hemodialysis dependency, no clinical signs of infective endocarditis or secondary focus of infections. Um, newly developed scoring systems can be used to assess patients' risk for infective endocarditis and the need for TEE. In criteria-negative patients, TE should be performed if high index of suspicion. And, uh, of course, more data is needed to evaluate performance of uh, the proposed scoring systems. So more research required. And I, I think uh, yeah, I will take questions. Is there any? Um, so the guidelines comment that um, it is possible to perform TE first, and in some of the cases, uh, the, the clinician would go ahead and perform TEE first, um, but TTE should be still obtained as it uh, serves um, uh, as a baseline test and something which is much easier to compare down the line. So let's say um, the current guidelines uh, uh, also made some recommendations uh, on obtaining um, echocardiography at the end of the treatment, um, in which case, let's say, TTE would serve as a much easier comparison rather than doing a repeat TE, right, which is an invasive procedure. 